Welcome to River Foursquare, where we meet in communities to learn about Jesus together, to discuss his words, and become more like him. If you want to know more, you can go to riverfoursquare.org and click on the Connect tab. And we are have our all-community gathering coming up on July 20th at 6 p.m. at Grace Church in Federal Way. Come on out for that for worship and prayer and communion. You're from the Seattle area. It's a great time to get together with everyone in our communities. And finally, if you're part of River, thank you so much for continuing to support River through your giving. You can do that at riverfoursquare.org and the Give tab, or you can text to 84321. Jesus, we thank you for today. Thank you that you're with us in our communities, because you said you would be. Holy Spirit, show us what we need to see today. Open our eyes to see things in a, in a different way. And use our gifts and talents to help illuminate and illustrate what you want to see illuminated and illustrated. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we, talk, we talked about that the believer's life is an empowered life a life empowered by the Holy Spirit, his spirit. And it's a life in where we are free to serve God, a life that we're free to choose God and not sin. We've been set free and we're we're free from all that would seek to enslave us because whatever we obey becomes our master. So if there is a a sin or an action or an attitude, if we choose to obey, it becomes our master. It becomes in control of us. And Jesus has empowered us to live by his spirit, to do what he did. And in that empowerment, there's a new closeness with God. There's a friendship with him. He calls us friend. This is a transformed life. This is a transformed life of a believer. It's spirit. It's a spirit empowered life. So question here for our communities. So how did you feel empowered by the Holy Spirit this week? What did the Holy Spirit do to give you the power to do the things that you faced, that you walked through, that you did? What was he active in in your life? Talk about that with your community.
sometimes we need to see things differently in, in a different light. There, there's the classic optical illusions you see online. There, there's thousands of them probably. Um, I, I think of the classic one. I may all put this up on the screen. Is the old lady and the young woman picture? I put it up on the screen. Uh, some of you guys see the old lady. Some of you see the young lady. Right, look, and it's usually if you've not seen it before or done this before, you struggle to see the other. So those of you who see the young lady are like, I don't see, I don't see an old lady at all. Those of you who see the old lady is like, I don't see the young woman at all. Here's a little tip for you: if you see the young lady, her chin is the nose of the old lady, and those of you who see the old lady, the nose is the chin of the young lady. That's that's the secret, right? And, but and here's the thing: is even as I said that, as you start to see that, you start to uh, that your vision starts to evolve. What you see, you're like, oh, I can see it now, and now you can flip between the two, right? You're like, oh, flip, 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 flip. It's not like anyone's changing anything on the picture, but your mind is flipping because you see things differently from a different pers perspective. Today. We need to do this. We need to change our perspective on what Jesus said and see it a different way. Just like that picture I had put up there, the old lady and the young woman were there the whole time, but we only saw one. We need to see this differently today, and it's going to change us. So we have this continuing conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples, the 11 at, at this time. Judas has already left. And it's a continued conversation from John 15, 16. All one conversation. So we're going to pick up here in John chapter 16, verse 16 through 24. So Jesus says, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father? So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. And Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, Is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, A little while, and you will not see me. And a little while, and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So Jesus is sharing with the disciples. And he says the events that are about to happen are going to take place quickly. It's going to be a, a a blur. It's going to be a whirlwind to use terms we would use. It's a whirlwind. And Jesus is speaking about his arrest, death, and resurrection. And the disciples still don't get it. And that's why Jesus says, he goes, in a little while you'll see me, in a little while you won't see me. It's like, it's Jesus is a magician. Right? It's like, whoop, gone. Right? He goes, and the disciples are like, what are you talking about? And so rather than Jesus explaining, guys, I'm going to get arrested, I'm going to, again, because it's not like they, he hasn't told them this many times, not just recently, but over the years he said this. He addresses their emotions. He addresses what they feel. And he goes, well, all right, fine. We're not going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about what you're going to feel. And he goes, and he, he it uses a natural uh, analogy about being a, a woman who goes into childbirth. She goes, she feels the pain and, and all the, 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 of the pains of labor. But when the baby is born, joy takes over. It's overwhelming. He goes, that's what it's going to be like. The emotional state you will be, you will be in the pain of labor, of anguish, of agony. 
and then that will change to joy. Joy that no one can ever take from you. You're going to have this whole transition. And it still goes down to it's going to be a whirlwind. The next 48, 72 hours, 96 hours is going to be a whirlwind, guys. It's going to be a whirlwind. Because what the disciples knew is the picture of a Messiah dying didn't fit their narrative. Because the Messiah was supposed to come and be king. Why would a king who was supposed to rule and reign and conquer and free the Jews from the oppression of the Roman Empire and everything else and restore everything, why would that king die? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And that's what they were struggling with. But at that resurrection, joy would come. And the relationship with the Father would change. It would change. And the Father would hear their requests in prayer, and he would answer. And the Father loves them as a friend, just like Jesus loved them as a friend. And something amazing was about to happen. And that's what Jesus was trying to convey here. So let's talk about this here. So have you ever had an experience in life where it was similar, whether it was actual childbirth or some kind of a, a you, you were laboring really intensely and hard and it was just like, this is never going to end. And you were just anguished wasn't and fun. things and it wasn't fun and it was hard work and miserable, but in the, you knew the end result was going to be good. And in the end, the work and all the things just brought so much joy that you're like, oh, it wasn't such a big deal. I mean, it was hard. It was good. But you like it, they glossed over all of the, the time and the energy and the things that you thought, I'm never going to make it through this. But the joy of knowing that you did it and you made it. Talk about that with your community.
John 16, 24. Let's look at this. You just read it. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. Sorrow to joy, that transition. When they see Jesus resurrected, everything changes. And the joy they experience, no one can take away. And we see that. We see that in the gospel accounts. As soon as they found out Jesus was, was res resurrected, you know, Peter sprinted to the tomb. Mary and Martha were overjoyed by this. They, they experienced that. That on that day, that, that Jesus said, in that day you ask nothing. On that day, which is the time after the resurrection, when the Holy Spirit's been given, that the relationship with the Father has been restored, that they are friends of the Father. That's super key. That's super key here. And the Holy Spirit has been given he's emp and the, to empower all believers to be with them, to be in them, and he's giving them answers to their requests, to their prayers. Let's look at John 16, 23 and 24. So the verse before it, let's look at this. It says, in that day, that day after his resurrection, you will ask nothing of me. Listen, I'm telling you the truest thing you've ever heard. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Let's just stop here. I just stop here for a second. In that day, the day of the resurrection, after the resurrection, after the Holy Spirit's been poured out, just he drops the he drops the verily, right? The truest thing ever. Listen to this. I'm about to drop a bomb. Whatever you ask the Father in my name. The Father in my name. He goes on to explain it. Let's keep going. He will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. We have the privilege of asking the Father for what we need because of Jesus. We have the privilege of asking the Father for what we need because of Jesus. Now let's let's go let's dive into the deep end of the pool here. Let's let's keep going underwater. Let's keep going here. Now we know by scripture the all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. We know Jesus has the authority and the power to do anything and all things. But why for us? Why for us? Why has this privilege of asking the Father been given to us? Why? Because Jesus makes the same. He goes, whatever you, I'll requote the lines, whatever you ask the Father because of me, he will do. Why? Well, because he already told us told us in John 15. Remember, this is a whole continuing conversation from 15 and 16. It's, it's, one, it's one conversation. It's one evening, if you will. It's, 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 it's one evening. Jesus in 15, 7 says that he goes, if you abide in me and, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Back to that abide. Abide means to, it's the Greek word meno, means to live with, to take up resonances. If we make doing what Jesus said to do the place where we live, our home, the words Jesus spoke, if we carry these out, if we choose to obey him, if we choose to live in a relationship that's been restored to be with him, what we ask will be done because of the relationship. Because of the relationship. If we choose to obey God, we're choosing to be in relationship with him. And God's will will be done. If we ask, he will. 
and it's done. And we've been empowered to choose him. To be in relationship with him. If we ask, he will. If we ask, he will. It's a privilege of every believer who chooses to follow him, to use the scripture word there, to live and abide and make their home in doing what Jesus said to do. It's a privilege of that believer. Believer, if you're not doing that, well, then that privilege, you got to work on that. But those believers, if you're choosing to do that, that privilege has been extended to us. We ask, and he does. Let's talk about this here. Share a time where God has answered a prayer, your prayer, or prayer for someone, prayer for yourself. Share a time, what, what, what was in need, and what did God do in relation to that need? Let's talk about that.
So all of this, all of these thoughts, is a culmination of all that Jesus has been saying. We know Jesus calls us friend. Here's where the picture changes from the old woman to the young lady, vice versa. So does the father. The father refers to his friend. This is our relationship. Okay. Really, the picture starts flipping. How Jesus interacted with the Father is how we are to interact with the Father. Let's look how Jesus lived. Remember back when Jesus had the loaves and the fish? He fed the 5,000 a couple times. If you remember the story here, you, you can go and look it up for yourself. It's pretty easy to find. It says they gather all the things, and what did he do? He thanked the Father for them. Father, thank you for this. I said, pass these out. Over and over again, we see that Jesus did what the Father was doing. Let's look at John chapter 5, verse 19, right? So, remember, Jesus has been telling us this. And Jesus said to him, and he goes, all right, look at this. Jesus told him, he goes, I'm telling you the truest thing ever. The son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. Now, let's, let's go explain. Let's, let's, not, let's make sure we're, we're thinking correctly about this. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. Jesus is God, all-powerful, all-knowing, present everywhere. He is God. And so is the Father, and so is the Spirit. Three in one. See, basics, episode one. When Jesus was on earth, 100% man, 100% God, that's the mystery of the incarnation is what we would call it. God becoming man. Everything our God did on earth, he did as a man to make the sacrifice on the cross matter. To make a sacri- the sacrifice on the cross matter. So that's why, that's why John points out his, that simple fact. Jesus did what he saw his father doing. He interacted with the father the same way we are to interact with the father. This is us. This is our relationship. That's why we ask the Father with the authority of Jesus. We talk to the Father because Jesus said so. It's, it's good. Go ahead. We, we learn in, in Hebrews that we can come boldly into the throne room of grace and make our request known to God. We interact with the Father the same way Jesus did. Jesus gave us an example of how we're to interact with the Father. And Jesus is telling us to ask and to receive that our joy may be full, that we would experience and see answered prayer. It's joy. And that we would know he hears us and we receive the answers to situations and problems. If we abide, if we do what he's asked us to do, if we live in the words of Jesus, according to John 5, in obedience, we receive. Now, this is a new situation. This is new. Why, this is why Jesus points out and goes, until now you've asked nothing in my name. This is a new thing. We are empowered by his spirit. And that's why what I spoke about last week is so important. It's the same thought. It's the same thing. Go back and listen last week. It's the same deal. They go, they go together. That we are free from the power of sin. And if we choose God, he is in charge of us, not sin. And if we abide in his words, if we do what he's asked us to do. Now, Jesus said, ask. Jesus said, ask. 
Ask for what? Ask for what? Well, it's answered in this. It's answered to this question. What do you need to complete the mission? What do you need to complete the mission? The call, the purpose, the, the things that, that you feel led that God has called you to do. What do you need to complete the mission? What is he commissioning you to do? Because he's commissioned every believer to be the messenger of what Jesus did. Every single one of us have a mission, and that looks a million different, a, bil- a trillion different ways. It's infinite based on your circumstance, situation. It's infinite. Now, we see this asking what we need to complete them a bunch of times in scriptures. Or, once again, back to the stories of the loaves and the fish. They needed food. They were hungry. They hadn't eaten all day. There was no store close by. There, there was no Walmart or Costco not sponsored. There, there, were, there, was, there was none of those things. So we fed them. We see another story in Matthew 17. Uh, verse 23, 27, where Jesus had to pay a temple tax, part of the Jewish life. And so he tells Pete, he goes, Pete, go down to, to the dock and throw a line in, catch a fish, and inside the fish, his belly, will be enough money to pay my temple tax and yours. Go ahead. They needed it to complete the mission. Remember that when he sent out the 12 and the 70, we obviously don't hear about the 70. 70 were another group of indiv- individuals who were followers of Jesus that Jesus trusted and entrusted with that were part of the, they were closer to Jesus. And he sent this, the 12 out and he sent the 70 out, a couple, two different occasions. And he says, go and I want you to tell them the, the, the message of the kingdom. Pray for the sick. Tell what I've done. And he says, don't take food with you. Don't take a change of clothes. Just take the clothes on your back and go. Why? Because the Father's going to provide for everything else they need to complete the mission. He will provide. We just ask. So let's break this down even more. It's kind of a long segment, but it, we, we're building here. Let's break this down even more. Now, once again, Believers, we're free from the power of sin. That we choose him and to serve him over and over again. And we're called by God to be messengers of the kingdom, of what Jesus did in so many different ways. So what do you need, believer, to fulfill that mission? What do you need? What do you need to fulfill the mission? Well, here, if you don't really rise, you need a roof over your head. You need a place to stay. House, apartment, Delma style. You need a place to stay. What else do you need? You need food. You got to eat, right? You got to eat. Got to drink. You, you, you need sustenance. What else do you need? You need clothes. You can't go around with nothing on. That would, that would prohibit the message of the cross, right? You, you need these things. Jesus addressed these things in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 to 33. He actually addresses them. He points them out. He says this. He goes, he's telling the, the disciples, he goes, don't be freaked out of saying, what will we eat and what will, shall we drink and what shall we wear? Sounds like what I just went over. Because for the non-Jews, there are already seek after these things. And look what he says. And your heavenly father knows you need them. Verse 33, look what he says. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. It sounds like John chapter 15, or John chapter 5, verse 17, doesn't it? If you abide in my words, or actually John 15, 17, if you abide in my words, seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus, Jesus is very consistent, very consistent. Hopefully the picture's starting to change. Old woman, young woman. If we're seeking first his kingdom, food, clothing, housing, the basic needs of life, we're not concerned with. What else do you need? You need health. 
You need healing in your body. Why? Because if you're plagued by things that distract you, it's hard to be a messenger of the kingdom. It distracts you. It limits you. To be pain-free, to be symptom-free, to be disease-free, this is the way of life. We've talked about extensively about that. Ask, and God will, because you need to fulfill the mission. If you need opportunity, ask that your joy may be full. Ask. We need to ask, and the Father will. And we can ask because we're in relationship with him. He says he wants to. And he says he will do it. Let's talk about this in our community here. So as you think about the mission that God's put you on and what you need in order to complete that mission as we're talking about this from this different perspective, just pause for a minute and then talk with your community about what are some of the things that you need to complete your mission? What has God called you to do? And what are things that you need to complete the mission? And has he provided those? Or are you still waiting for those to come? And have you ever asked him for those things? Or do you go, oh, I think I'm called to do this, but I need all these things and I don't know how to get them, so I'm just going to stay here. What are the things that you need to do to complete your mission? Talk about that with your community.
So, in all this, what haven't we asked God to do? Maybe we just talked about their community. What haven't we asked God to do? And what I mean by that is what circumstance and what situation have we not asked God to intervene in? I know it seems like, well, trust me. Old lady, young woman, here we go. What areas have we been enduring and putting up with and haven't asked the Father to intervene? Or areas that we've asked but we haven't really believed. We haven't understood the privilege we have that if we ask, he will. Because we need to get back to asking. We need to get back to asking. And sometimes our lack of asking can be because we're complaining. And so we're complaining to God, but we're not asking. You get what I mean, the difference? That we're having this internal dialogue about how hard it is. And you know what? It might be. But we haven't turned that into Jesus. You said ask the Father. We haven't made that 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 we haven't we haven't whipped the U-turn yet. We haven't we haven't pulled it. We haven't whipped that wheel around and said, wait a minute. And we haven't asked. We haven't taken that request and made it prayer. Asking to the one who can make a difference. Who said he wants to make a difference. And in that, we need to understand that we're not some nobody off the street. Believer, you're not a nobody off the street. He knows you. He calls you what? Friend. We're in relationship with him. You live in and follow God's command. You abide in his words. You relate to the Father the same way Jesus relates to the Father. You've been empowered by his spirit. You've been given his spirit. You've been given his spirit. So, Romans 8, 32. He, Jesus, or I'm sorry, the Father in this instance. The Father who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Paul in Romans is talking about the same thing Jesus is in John chapter 16. He's talking about the same thing. Ask and receive. Why? So you would see the joy of answered prayer. So you would see the love of the Father. So you would be enveloped and overwhelmed with who he is. Because you're in relationship with him. It's an honor. It's a privilege. And Jesus came to give. So do it. So do it question here. All right. So we talked about things that we need for the mission just a little bit ago, and that may have sparked some ideas and some thoughts in your head. So we're just going to take a quiet moment. You pull out your phone, get out a note or something on your calendar so you can make a note of today. Write down and ask for with Jesus the things that you still don't have to complete the mission that he know he's called you to do. Ask him. Don't just sit around, well, if I had these things, then I'd be doing X. That would be really nice if I could go do this. Or I feel like God wants me to do this, but I need all these parts. Let's change that. Let's stop just talking about it and complaining about it or wishing about it. But let's ask. Go to your father. He wants to do for you big things. He's a big God. 
So take a quiet moment in your community and ask. And let it be the start of a conversation between you and him that goes on forever. relationship with him we're in relationship with him we are his friends he said ask he said ask we need to stop complaining and start asking start having conversations with him to the one who can make a difference. Ask that your joy may be full. What do you need to complete the mission? What in your areas in your life that are lacking? Ask. Ask. And receive that your joy may be full. It's overwhelming. It's overflowing. Mind 
blowing. It's all a rhyming. I'm still rhyming. Okay, stop. That's Zoe. That's Zoe life. That's what he has for us. Remember John 10, 10, I came to give you Zoe and Zoe and Zoe. A lot of it. Receive it by asking. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the privilege you've extended to us by your death and resurrection on the cross. Father, we're in need of things. As people have already requested and, and started a conversation with you, Father, we know you will do because that's who you are. We receive the life that you have for us. We choose to believe you. We choose to engage with you the same way your son engaged with you. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.